As we sit here today, it was one year ago today, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You said in Warsaw that Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. So how does this war end and what does a victory look like? Well, that depends on what the Ukrainians decide. But here's what we have to do in the meantime. We have to put the Ukrainians in a position where they can make advances this spring and summer and move to a place where a negotiated, she, they can negotiate from a position of strength. And, uh, but, you know, that expression you've heard me use before and others, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. We're not going to dictate to them what the end result is. When you talk about them negotiating, does that mean they get to keep Crimea and parts of the east? That means they, they decide that. They, the, they, the, uh, the uh, Ukrainians decide that. But I could picture a circumstance where there is a, a transition to that. It's not all one time. Look, a year ago today, there were only 70 kilometers from the border where we, the Russians expected they'd come rolling down into Kiev and own it all. They got pushed back. It didn't happen. And, they've, and I think they estimate, underestimated a great deal the Russians did. But a reality check for the American people watching this at home tonight. Could you and I be sitting here a year from now talking about the war in Ukraine still? Well, we could. I, I, I'm not a prognostic. I can't. I know I'm a crystal ball. But look, for all the difficulty that Ukraine has in maintaining the weaponry, having what they need, and so on and so forth, uh, the circumstance in Russia is even worse. Russia's, uh, you know, they put 180,000 forces into Ukraine a year ago today, an invasion. And where are they? Where are they? You announced another 2.5 billion in aid to Ukraine today, 113 billion now. We know the vast majority of Americans support Ukraine, but there are now many who are asking, how long can we spend like this? Well, first of all, I'm not sure how many are asking. I know the mega crowd is. The, the right-wing Republicans are, you know, talking about we can't do this. You find ourselves in a situation where the cost of doing, of walking away could be considerably higher than the cost of helping Ukraine maintain its independence. We know the Germans are now sending tanks in after the U.S. said it would send Abrams tanks as well. But we know President Zelensky continues to say what he really needs are F-16s. Will you send F-16s? Look, we're sending him what our seasoned military thinks he needs now. He needs tanks, he needs artillery, he needs air defense, including another HIMARS. There's things he needs now that we're sending him to put him in a position to be able to make gains this spring and this summer going into the fall. You don't think he needs F-16s now? No, he doesn't need F-16s now. Is that a never? Look, first of all, the idea that we know exactly what's going to be needed a year, two, three from now, but there is no basis upon which there is a rationale, according to our military now, to provide F-16s. But you're not ruling it out? I am ruling it out for now. For now. Vladimir Putin told the Russian people this week that China's President Xi is coming to Russia, uh, likely as early as this spring. I know the State Department and the Pentagon now have both warned China not to offer lethal military assistance to Russia in this war with Ukraine, saying the U.S. is concerned that China is considering providing lethal support to Russia. Would that cross a line for you? Look, it's not in China's... I had a very frank conversation with President Xi this past summer on this issue. And I pointed out to him, I, the, the conversation went like this. I said, Mr. President, this is not a threat, it's just an assertion, a statement of what I think the reality is. You saw what happened when the rest of the world, Europe in particular, saw the brutality of what Putin Ukraine to the Ukrainians from Russia. And I said, without any government prodding, 600 American corporations left, left Russia, from McDonald's to Exxon to across the board. And I said, and if you are engaged in the same kind of brutality by supporting the brutality that's going on, I said, you may face the same consequence. I don't anticipate, we haven't seen it yet, but I don't anticipate a major initiative on the part of China providing weaponry to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to Russia. But if they did, would that be crossing a line for you, Mr. President? 
it would be the same line everyone else would have crossed. In other words, we, we impose severe sanctions on anyone who has done that. So there would be serious consequences? I'll let you ca characterize what they would be. We would respond. I ask you all of this because there's a new report in the German newspaper, Der Spiegel, that the Russian military could be negotiating right now with a Chinese drone manufacturer to produce kamikaze drones for Russia. Are you aware of this? Is U.S. intelligence tracking this? U.S. intelligence is aware of everything that's going on in this area, but I'm not going to confirm specifically what U.S. intelligence has found out or not found out. What do you make of this Chinese peace plan uh, floated overnight that Putin is now applauding today? I think you answered the question. Putin's applauding it. How, so how could it be any good? I'm not being facetious. I'm being deadly earnest. I've seen nothing in the plan that would indicate that there is something that would be beneficial to anyone other than Russia if the Chinese plan were followed. And so the idea that China is going to be negotiating the outcome of a war that's a totally unjust war for Ukraine is just not rational. Let me ask about U.S.-China relations in general, already strained after the Chinese spy balloon over the U.S. Let me just ask you this first. Do we know definitively yet whether or not that spy balloon was flying over the continental U.S. intentionally? It is almost not relevant once it was over the United States. So there's a possibility President Xi didn't know? There is a possibility of that. Were they surveilling the U.S. or attempting to? That's what that balloon does, surveillance. Let me ask you, when the balloon was shot down off South Carolina, the defense secretary, a place to call to his Chinese counterpart on a line that's supposed to always be open, the Chinese did not take the call. They didn't pick up the phone. Does that trouble you? Yes. There should be a direct open line of communications, particularly for two, two most powerful nations in the world, to be able to resolve anything quickly so there's not a mistake made. The defense secretary says they still haven't had that call. How does the U.S., how does your administration fix this? We make it clear that it's necessary for that to occur. We can't fix it. I want to ask you about a couple of issues here at home. It's been three weeks now since the toxic train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, as you know. The mayor says he saw you in Ukraine, and he says it tells you he doesn't care about us. They're asking, is the president coming to Ohio? Do you have any plan to travel to Ohio? And have you talked with the mayor yet? Let's put this in perspective. Within two hours of that derailment, the EPA was in there. Within two hours. Every major agency in the United States government that had anything to do with rail and or cleanup was there and is there. In addition to that, I've spoken at length to the congresspersons, the governors, the senators from both states of Pennsylvania and, and in uh, Ohio. And I've made it clear to them anything they need is available, we'll make it available to them. Whatever happens here, we've got to understand it's the responsibility of the railroad company, who's made, by the way, tens of billions of dollars in profits. Tens of billions of dollars of profits lately. So do you plan to travel there and have you talked with the mayor? I, I, I can't recall where that. I don't think I've talked to the mayor. I've talked to everyone else there and multiple times. I've talked to both the senators, both, uh, both governors. I've talked to, uh, to everyone there is to talk to. And we've made it clear that everything is available. Let me ask you the question everyone is asking. Are you running? Well, apparently someone interviewed my wife today, I heard. I heard and, that, too, just before and, I came and in. I, I got to call her and find out. No, all kidding aside. Uh, my intention is from, has been, been from the beginning to run, but there's too many other things I have to finish in the near term before I start a campaign. Well, let me ask you, you brought up your wife, uh, the First Lady, Jill Biden, obviously, traveling in Kenya. She was asked just today, is all that's left at this point simply setting a time and a place for the announcement? And she said, pretty much. <laughs> Do you agree with your wife's assessment? Say, God love her. Yeah, uh, look, I, I, I meant what I said. I've got other things to finish before I get into a full-blown campaign. Let me ask you about a conversation that people are having uh, at home. Both your supporters and your critics, they know that if you're reelected, you would be 82 when you're sworn in. You would be uh, 86 at the end of your term. Is your age part of your own calculation into whether to run again? No, uh, but it's a legitimate for people to raise issues about my age. 
It's totally legitimate to do that. And the only thing I can say is watch me. Let me ask you one of the immediate questions, uh, if and when you do announce that you're running again. Uh, you and the former president are both now under investigation by the Justice Department for the discovery of these classified documents. I know that you believe these two cases are very different. But I do remember something you said after the discovery at Mar-a-Lago. You said, I thought data that was in there may compromise sources and methods and names of people who help, and it's just totally irresponsible. Can you assure the American people that none of the documents discovered in your garage or at your old office compromised sources or methods or U.S. intelligence? I've been advised by the counsel, let the Justice Department make that decision to not try to alter the case in any way. There have been very few documents that have been confiscated, found in my possession that were in other than, I mean, in my possession, meaning in my home. All the stuff that was moved out of my Senate office over the years, I'm told there were a couple things that were from 1973 or 74 documents were marked classified. I don't know of anything, and maybe, I don't know of anything that is marked like it was, you know, top secret, highly, you know, et cetera. But I, I, I'm told not to comment on that because I don't even know what they are able to, what, what, what they confiscated. There are many who will understand why you can't comment, why your lawyers are saying uh, not to comment. They also saw you, though, comment on former President Trump. And, and so at the very least... Because, look, here's what they were showing. They were, you guys were showing on television things lying on the ground and said top secret, national, you know, uh, code word. And the difference is every single solitary thing I've been asked to do, I've done voluntarily. I've invited the Justice Department to come into every aspect of any place that I had any control of. There, there was no need for search warrants, or no need, what do you need? Just come, whatever you want. Whatever you want, wherever you want to go, you can go. That was totally different. But that, that one word you used, when you, when you hear about boxes in your garage or in your old office, you, you called the Trump discovery irresponsible. Is there something irresponsible here, though, too? You know, you're a good lawyer, but you're trying to make a, a comparison. What, there's degrees of irresponsibility that are, they can be significant degrees of responsibility. What, the way in which the boxes were packed up from my office, apparently, not everything was gone through as meticulously as it should have. But there was no intention. I opened up my home, all my homes. My homes, my, the home of the beach and the home that I, my permanent home. And they spent hours and hours going through everything, personal, ev everything I had. And that's a fundamentally different thing. There's nothing for me to hide.